All right, I think we can go ahead and get started. Are there any questions from last time? Okay, well, let me go ahead and remind you uh, what we've been doing. So we defined uh, hyperbolic graphs last time and we saw that they, were they could be defined in two different ways. Uh, one was we said that triangles were delta slim if uh, if any two if any two sides of a triangle were contained within or if any side of a triangle was contained within a delta neighborhood of the other two sides and if there existed such a delta such that every triangle every geodesic triangle is delta thin then we said that it was a hyperbolic space and then we said that there was another equivalent way, and that is that for any geodesic triangle and a geodesic metric space, uh, there's this tripod, uh, this comparison tripod, and this, this map F here, which is isometric on each of the edges individually, uh, on each of the geodesics. And then we said a triangle was, was delta thin, uh, and then you had the Gromov product of, of numbers. It was exactly the length of the distance from X to the triple point in this comparison tripod. This was this Gromov product YZX. And we, sa we said that the uh, triangle was delta thin if whenever you took two points in your triangle and they got mapped to the same point in the comparison tripod, and that had to be because they were distance delta apart. They were somehow not too far apart from each other. And then we, we saw that uh, for the uh, geodesic metric space to be delta, uh, if every triangle was delta slim, then every triangle was four delta thin. And conversely, if every triangle is delta thin, then every triangle is delta slim. So hyperbolic, uh, Hyperbolic metric spaces are, are defined equivalently that every triangle is delta, there's some delta such that every triangle is delta uh, thin. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, so then we introduced, so that's a hyperbolic uh, metric space, a hyperbolic graph. And then we introduced this notion of quasi isometric embedding, uh, which is that it's like an isometric embedding, except we're allowed bounded error. So we're allowed a multiplicative error constant in C, and we're allowed an additive error constant in R. And then we also introduced this notion of a quasi-geodesic, uh, which again has errors C and R, uh, multiplicative and, uh, and additive. Um, and then the, the remark was that a quasi-isometric embedding took uh, took geodesics to quasi-geodesics with the corresponding C and R. And then we were gonna prove this proposition. So this is what we're going to work on now. In fact, maybe I'll go ahead and copy it over and then paste it. Uh, so we're gonna prove this proposition, which says that in a hyperbolic uh, graph, um, that if you have a quasi-geodesic, it's not too far away from an actual geodesic. Right, so let me copy, copy this over and then we'll, we'll talk, talk about this. All right, so uh, this is a statement of the proposition we want to prove. So here we have gamma as a hyperbolic graph, hyperbolic connected graph. Uh, we have constant C and R, which are fixed. And so then there exists another constant D, which only depends on C, R, and delta, uh, whatever the delta hyperbolicity constant is, uh, such that if we have any C, R quasi-geodesic alpha and any genuine geodesic beta, uh, such that they have the same origin and terminal points, then we have that their Hausdorff distance is not too far away. It's, it's bounded by this D, right? So D is independent of alpha and beta. It only depends on uh, C, R, and this delta, whatever gave us this hyper, hyperbolic, hyperbolicity constant uh, for the graph, right? And so in particular, I mentioned that this 
then implies that, of course, if you have a, a quasi-isometric embedding of, hyper of one space into a hyperbolic space, then that first space has to also be hyperbolic. All right, so that's how we really want to use this. Uh, so let's go ahead and give a proof of, of this fact here. All right, so uh, maybe I can draw a picture. Uh, so I'm not so great at drawing pictures. I'm sure other people can draw pictures uh, very well, but here's the idea. So here we have um, some uh, initial point, alpha zero, uh, some other point here. So this is like, uh, I want to make sure I stick with my notation and my notes or else I'm going to get very confused. I don't think I labeled the initial point. So here's alpha zero, here's some alpha n, the terminal point, and these are also uh, the terminal points for beta. And, and we have some beta, which kind of, you know, goes along a nice line like this. So this is, you know, my beta, this is a nice geodesic path. And then the alpha is uh, going to look something like, you know, this It's not, you know, the alpha is something like this, that it's, it's far away, it looks like this path, but it's, uh, it's a quasi geodesic. So there's some error here. And, uh, and to do this proof, I'll go ahead and let's go ahead, we'll start with alpha and beta. Uh, so take such an alpha and beta, and let's let uh, d naught be the maximum distance uh, from uh, alpha to beta. I need to get on the page with my notes. Here we go. Uh, so let's set d naught to be the maximal distance from uh, or beta to alpha. So from a point P to alpha, such that P is a point on beta. Now the proposition says that there's some bound in, in Hausdorff distance. And here I've just given you the distance from uh, beta to alpha. So let me argue that the distance from alpha to beta is also somehow controlled by this uh, constant here. And then we'll just work with this d naught. Uh, so the thing to note, notice there, uh, yeah, is that if Uh, I'm just not lost in my notes here a little bit. Yeah, okay, so let's go ahead and do this. So if Q naught is some point on alpha, so then I wanna claim that this is not too far away from beta depending on this constant uh, D naught. Uh, so what do we know? We know that for each, uh, for each, so let's go ahead and say fix Q naught point on alpha. And then we know that for each U on beta, there is some U prime on alpha, such that the distance between U and U prime is less than or equal to D naught. 
that's the definition of D naught was such such that that was the case. Um, and now let's look at this particular Q naught. So either either the distance from Q naught to beta is uh, is less than or equal to D naught, uh, or else the Q naught is never one of these beta primes. So uh, if it's greater than D naught or else there exists consecutive points, say U naught U1 on beta, such that u naught prime is before uh, q naught and u naught prime or u1 prime is after q naught. Uh, well, we'll, we'll go, since they have the same endpoints, we'll assume that uh, u is uh, u prime is equal to u if u is an endpoint. So at some point, so the alpha is just some sequence that starts over here and ends over here. So uh, as we go along the sequence, there are all these u primes. And at some point, we're going to get to consecutive points such that one is before this q naught and the next one is after this uh, q naught. Uh, so what is, uh, yeah, so, so how does that help us? Uh, well, what do we know? We know that uh, the distance from u naught prime to u one prime, this because it's a quasi -ge geodesic, um, uh, well, no, it's not because it's quasi -ge geodesic, it's just because we have this bound right here, and we know that the distance between u and u u naught and u u one is one. So this is certainly less than or equal to twice d naught plus one. Uh, but now we can use the fact that it's a quasi geodesic, and so we have the length of the subsequence. from u naught prime to u1 prime, so in alpha, is uh, at most, because it's a quasi-geodesic, uh, we know that this is uh, at most, um, so the distance here is 2d plus one, so this is gonna be c times 2d naught plus one plus r. Right, so therefore we get that the distance from u naught to q say is uh, certainly bounded by this length. Uh, u naught is somewhere in between there. And so, uh, well, uh, we can write it out. It's triangle inequality distance from u naught to u naught prime plus distance from u naught prime to q naught. Uh, so this distance right here uh, is at most d naught. And this distance right here, well, now we have an initial point of the segment and we have a point in between the segment. And again, it's a quasi geodesic. Uh, so we get, it can be no more but the length, but then we have an extra bound uh, coming from the quasi geodesic. So I guess it'll be C times C two d naught plus one plus r and then another r is going to be 2r. So we get this bound. But what this number is doesn't actually matter so much. All that matters is that we get some upper bound, which depends on d naught, uh, c, and r. So this means that if we can find an upper bound for d naught, then we found an upper bound for the Hausdorff, Hausdorff distance. So therefore, we will only uh, find an upper bound for this d naught. Uh, so, to finish the proposition, we will 
find an upper bound for the knot, which since I had to move to the next page, I'll remind you this is a set of points. Uh, this is, uh, where is it right here? The set of distances for key points on beta. So it's the distance from key to alpha, such that P is a point on beta. All right, and again, I'll go ahead and copy over this picture here to give us some intuition. All right, so here's the picture, and now we want to find a bound, an upper bound on this D map. And so how are we going to do that? So by an upper bound, I mean some upper bound, which only depends on C, R, and delta. Uh, so how are we going to do that? We're going to go ahead and choose a point on, on beta, which maximizes uh, this distance. So I'll go ahead and choose some P naught on beta such that the distance from P naught to alpha is equal to this D naught. So this is some, some point here, maybe something like this. Uh, and then we're, Yeah, and then we're gonna give ourselves a little bit of room here. So I'm gonna choose two uh, points here and here. So I'll go ahead and choose. Choose now uh, B naught and B1 on beta, such that the distance from P naught uh, to B naught is the same as the distance from P naught to B1, which is equal to two uh, D naught. So I'll give myself, give myself a little bit of room. So this distance right here, so this is my B naught, this is B1, and I've chosen it such that this distance is two D naught, and this distance is two D naught. Uh, so there's, uh, of course, we can always do this unless P naught happens to be close to one of the endpoints, in which case we might run to the end. So if, uh, so if we cannot choose such a P naught and B1, uh, take them to be endpoints. So if we don't have enough room on this path beta to choose such a thing, I'll just set them to be the endpoints, whatever they happen to be. Uh, okay, so this is, uh, so this gives us a little bit of room. And now what I want to do is I want to choose uh, points on alpha, which are not too far away. Uh, so we'll go ahead Uh, yeah, so let's go ahead and choose, though we'll choose the closest points we can get to alpha. So this is going to be A naught, and this is going to be like A1 here. So we're going to choose A naught and A1 on alpha, such that the distance between AI and BI is as small as it can be. So this is the distance between alpha and BI. Right, so we'll just go ahead and choose those AIs. And then I just want to choose um, any geodesics connecting uh, these BKs to off case. So now, now we're gonna add in geodesics. So we're just gonna add in here some geodesic and we're gonna add in here geodesic. I'm not call this gamma naught, I'm not call this gamma one. Uh, doesn't really matter which direction they go. Um, 
But okay, so we're now we're going to choose uh, geodesics, gamma i, uh, connecting uh, BK to uh, AK, where K equal one or two, zero or one. All right, we'll just choose these. And now this gives us, uh, by combining this, uh, we get a nice path. By combining this with the segment of beta, we get a nice path from A0 to A1. Uh, OK. Uh, and now what I want to do, So the thing to notice uh, is now what we're going to do is we're going to let alpha prime be the subsequence of alpha from A naught to A1. All right, so A naught is an alpha, A1 is an alpha, so we'll just choose, uh, so they both appear somewhere in alpha, we'll just choose the subsequence. If we somehow got unlucky and maybe, maybe alpha one appeared later or alpha zero appeared later in the sequence than alpha one did for some reason, uh, but that would be okay, we just let the alpha flow backwards if that's the case. Right? So just at some subsequence of this uh, sequence alpha, uh, so that's going to be my alpha prime, and uh, and so now what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to make a few observations. So note first that the distance from p naught to gamma i is. Uh, at least uh, greater than or equal to d naught. Why is that? That's because we know that the length of gamma i is at most d naught, and we chose the beta i such that they're at least two d naught away. So this forces the point b naught to be at least be d naught away from gamma i. Or if the b i's were the endpoints, then of course the a i's would equal the b i's, and uh, and so we would also have this inequality in that case as well. All right, the other thing uh, I want to notice is that the, uh, also note that the distance between A naught to A1 is not too large. So we can just use the triangle inequality and say that this is at most the distance from A naught to B naught plus the distance from B naught to B1 plus the distance from uh, B1 to A1, which uh, here we have is uh, D naught plus 4 D naught plus D naught. All right. And what does that mean? So alpha was a quasi geodesic. And so here we have two points and their length is at most 60 knots. So therefore the length of alpha prime is at most six uh, C G naught plus R. Right? Because it was a CR quasi geodesic. All right, so now we're going to define, uh, define gamma to be the sequence, uh, which is going to connect A naught to A1, which is, uh, or connecting, or sorry, connecting B naught to B1, sequence connecting B naught to B1 uh, by uh, taking gamma naught, then 
alpha prime than gamma one. All right, so uh, what is gamma? So we first go up here, then we go through alpha prime. So alpha prime is going to give us something here, and then we go back down here. All right, so this is taking us from B naught uh, to B1. Uh, and then the thing to notice about this is that the uh, distance, so here's a few facts about that. The first is that the distance from P naught to gamma is greater than or equal to D naught. That's just because we observed up here that it's true for gamma i, and we already know by assumption that it's true for alpha. And so this whole path gamma lives on gamma i or alpha. Uh, and then we also know that the length, the length uh, of gamma, just meaning the number of terms in the sequence, uh, is at most the length of the gamma i's plus the length of uh, alpha prime. So that's the gamma i's themselves. Uh, we already observed somewhere that, uh, well, their length at most d naught. So this is, uh, we're going to get here, where is alpha prime is 6c, and then we're going to get an extra 2 times d naught plus i. So that's the length of this gamma. Uh, and then one more thing, and that is that at each step, we have that the distance from gamma k to gamma k plus 1. So we also have that it's this quasi, uh, so this is less than or equal to uh, this c. And then we're going to have um, plus r, or it could be just r1. 1 if it's on the endpoint, so I'll just combine that by saying c times 1 plus r. And this is for all k. All right, so this is the situation we're going to do. And now what we're going to do is we're going to take this path and we're just going to cut it in half. And so far we haven't used anywhere the hyperbolic geometry. So we're going to take this uh, sequence, we're going to cut it in half, and then we're going to look at these triangles uh, coming from uh, either P naught and uh, the three points. So it's either we're going to look at these triangles coming from here, here, and the midpoint of the sequence, and we're, or we're going to look at this, these triangles, these three triangles here, um, I guess here. So we'll look at these three triangles, and then we're going to use the hyperbolicity there to allow us to move P naught slightly and make it a little bit closer to the triangles. So this is, this is the idea. Uh, so Unfortunately, I have to go on to the next screen. Um, so maybe I can at least copy over the properties of this path gamma that we're going to use. All right, so these are the properties uh, of gamma that we want to use. Uh, Okay, so like I said, we're going to let C be the uh, midpoint of gamma. Uh, or if, you know, maybe gamma has odd or has even length, then we'll just choose C to be, you know, closest to the midpoint since I'm viewing these as graphs. So the, the midpoint or next to it uh, or next to it. If gamma has an even length, maybe it doesn't have a midpoint. Uh, and uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and then we're going to consider this geodesic and consider uh, a geodesic triangle. Delta given by just take geodesics from B naught to C uh, and take geodesics from C to B1 and geodesics from uh, B naught to B1. Uh, 
All right. So this is, I think maybe I misspoke a little bit on the picture here. So the geodesic triangle we're considering is uh, this geodesic triangle. And then we have, that's the point here is P lies on the line segment there. So this segment from B naught to B1, we're gonna take to be beta specifically. So beta. Uh, okay, so now let me draw the picture here. So we have B naught, we have this path here, we have B1, and now we have P naught somewhere along this line. And now we have C. And now we have that uh, this is hyperbolic, so the triangle looks something like this. Uh, and now what we can say is that since, uh, so since gamma is hyperbolic, is delta hyperbolic, say, uh, there exists. P1, so that means that this, oh, here we're gonna use the delta slim condition. So that means that this side here is within a delta neighborhood of one of the two other sides. So there exists P1 uh, on either the geodesic segment from B naught to C1 or C, or B naught to C or C to B1. Uh, such that the distance from P naught to P1 is less than delta. All right, so in this first case, so if P1 is on the geodesic sec segment from B naught to C, uh, so then we have here, so then I'm just going to copy my situation over to this uh, edge of this triangle here, right? So I'll create a new B naught, a new B1 will be C. So then we're gonna set, say B naught uh, one to be B naught. We're gonna set uh, B one prime or B one one to be C. Uh, otherwise, uh, we'll do it the other way around. If P1's on the other side, we're going to set B01 to be C and uh, B11 to be B1. So that uh, P1 is on this geodesic between, between these two things. And then we'll take gamma prime, the subsequence of gamma uh, containing, uh, connecting B naught prime to B one prime. All right, so here we have this path gamma. Remember this path gamma is going somewhere. It goes up here to, and then it goes over here and then it goes down something like this. So this is gamma. And so we can just, uh, you know, take this to be our gamma one, our gamma prime. And what do we notice about this? Well, C was chosen to be the midpoint of gamma. So we know the length of gamma prime uh, is certainly at least less than or equal to two thirds the length of gamma. So now what, what we can do is now we can repeat this process. So we now take the midpoint here and now this is you know C2 or something and then we create this geodesic triangle here. And now we'll get another P2. And then we'll keep repeating this process uh, over and over again. So we'll take a new you know, C3. We'll look at this triangle here and then we'll get another one, right? 
So repeating this, uh, we uh, eventually what's going to happen is at some point we'll terminate uh, we're repeating this we will terminate uh, after well since each time we're cutting by two-thirds uh, so this will term the length of time that we'll need will be logarithm of this so the we'll terminate after um, uh, L steps with L bounded by the log of the length of gamma divided by, say, log two thirds or three halves. Uh, and then eventually what we do when we get um, all of this is we, we get uh, that P naught will be contained in one of these uh, paths that'll be um, cons between consecutive points of gamma. Right, so this is uh, where we have B naught is going to be between these two. So we get this and we get PL is on this geodesic segment from B not L to B one L where B not L and B one L are consecutive terms. in gamma. All right, so we keep bisecting gamma until we get to this situation. It's not going to take more than this. All right, so what does that mean? Well, remember all of these, uh, yeah, so therefore, when we combine all this, we get uh, the following what? inequalities. Question? One question, aren't the points V0 in alpha? Isn't the yes. gamma the... So why are they consecutive points on, on gamma? I, I mean, when consecutive points, I mean consecutive terms, meaning one is, uh, one is well, they're gamma of n and one oh, is gamma. Oh, OK, I understand. Like gamma L has like length one, basically. Right? Uh, yeah, I mean, the, I'm not saying, I'm not claiming that the distance between these is one. I'm just claiming that they're consecutive terms in gamma. Right, gamma consists of these geodesics from B naught to A, and then it goes along A. And all along A, it's a quasi geodesic, but they need not be geodesics. Okay, okay. Um, yeah. But by construction, each time Pn is going to be on the, on Pn is on a geodesic from you know, Bn to, or B, B not N to B one N, right? By our construction, Pn is always between P not N and uh, P one N. It's always on a geodesic between them. So we get that PL will be on a geodesic between B not L and B one L, uh, but I'm not claiming that B not L and B one L are distance one apart. I'm just claiming they're consecutive terms in this path gamma. That's all I'm saying. All right, uh, so what is putting all this together? What do we see? We see that D naught, uh, this was the distance uh, from P naught to gamma, where we knew it was less than or equal to the distance from P naught to gamma. Um, but now uh, here I have that this is less than or equal to, I'll just do the triangle inequality each time and notice that when we go to PI to PI plus one, we lose only a matter of delta. So this will be L times delta, whatever this L is, plus, and now we have the distance from uh, B not L to B one L, because P L is on a, on a geodesic between these. So we get this bound, but then we also have this bound for L. 
So this is all less than or equal to uh, delta, and then we have log three halves inverse times log of the length of gamma, which I wrote uh, I wrote up here, the length of gamma. So that's six C plus two times D naught plus R. Uh, so that's the length of gamma. So that's L and now we have times, oh, we already did the times delta. And now we have plus the distance here, but that's a quasi geodesic. So we know the distance there is at most C times one plus R, right? That's what I uh, noted right here. Consecutive terms, their distance C plus C. All right, so this is the formula that we have derived. Uh, but what do we see? We see that the uh, terms on the left is linear in D, and the term on the right, so C, R, and delta are fixed. They're all given to us. And so the term on the right, the D naught term is logarithmic. And we know that linear growth is, is faster than logarithmic growth. So what does this mean is that if D naught were unbounded, uh, then we would get a contradiction, right? If, if there was no bound on D naught, then the left-hand side would eventually be greater than the right-hand side, right? So the consequence is that therefore there has to be a bound on D naught, which only depends on C, R, and delta. So the consequence, hence, Uh, so since, since linear growth is faster than logarithmic growth, this gives a bound on D naught. Uh, in terms of uh, C, R, and delta. And so that finishes the proof. Uh, so there's that. Okay. Any questions about this? Oh, yes. Can I ask a question? Yes. Uh, is this quasi geodesic defined on integers? I uh, say that again. Uh, is the quasi geodesic defined mm -hmm. on integers on Z or R? I uh, you know the, the quasi geodesic. This is just defined as a finite sequence of points. Uh, and right, so the quasi this was uh, I guess last time. Here's the where's the definition? Uh, yeah, here's the definition. So a quasi-geodesic, yeah, it's just a sequence of integers. So everything here I've done just with sequences and graphs. I know, I, so I've been going back and forth. So last time, so I, I'm really interested in graphs, but last time I, I talked about uh, how we can view graphs as a continuous metric space. Uh, yeah, but here I, everything I've done today has just been as a discrete metric space. Okay, so, so what is gamma? Oh, so is it lambda? No, no, gamma. What is gamma here? Because it seems that we are connecting a sequence of points with continuous geodesics. No, no, no. Gamma here. So I've drawn it uh, continuous just for intuitive reasons, but this is all discrete. So uh, what is gamma? Uh, you know, gamma is a discrete geodesic. These gamma i's are discrete geodesics, and I'm just putting all, I'm just putting, so gamma is not a geodesic. Uh, gamma i's are geodesic, so I have this geodesic going from b naught to a a naught. Then I go in my sequence to a one, and then I go down this to a geodesic to b one. Okay, right? so, the, so gamma gamma is just a sequence. So in in that case, doesn't it change the parameter of quasi geodesics? Uh, does it change the parameter of quasi geodesics? No, because gamma naught is a geodesic. Gamma one is a geodesic, and alpha here is a quasi geodesic with the CR. Oh, so we are, uh, I see. So we take 
uh, we divide gamma no and gamma one into you know equal size of points. Uh, no, no, no. But actually, I, I'm I'm not even I don't even think I claimed anywhere that gamma was a geodesic. All I claimed was uh, this the consecutive. I mean, we have this for consecutive terms. That's that's all I used, which which implies that it's a. Um, oh, I guess yeah, it doesn't uh, imply necessarily. Yeah, I'm not complain. I'm not claiming that gamma is a is a quasi geodesic or a CR quasi geodesic. All I'm claiming is that consec we have this bound on consecutive terms in gamma. That's all I'm claiming. Okay, so if d no is greater than, uh, if d no is very large, we need to divide uh, gamma no and gamma one. Right. Uh, if d not is very large, we need to divide gamma not and gamma one. No, no. No, 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 I think it's fine. So alpha is the quasi geodesic. Gamma naught and gamma one are actual geodesics. Uh, so when we combine them, we certainly have this inequality. So the R, the C times R comes from the, the quasi geodesic alpha when you're traveling along alpha, uh, or the terms are actually in a geodesic, in which case it's one. So may, maybe I could write this as, maybe it would look better as the, the maximum of um, C plus R and one. Oh, so uh, here geodesics is also a sequence of points. Yes. Oh, I see. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, a geodesic is is just a sequence of points uh, such that the distance between uh, gamma or between beta of n and beta of m is n minus n. Okay, great. Any other questions? All right, but I think here the intuition for this argument is, is this sort of bisection process here that we uh, have B naught, we have B1, we have some point here, and then we have the alphas over here, uh, you know, and so we just take the midpoint of alpha and then just start bisecting, and that gives us some sequence of P's, which gives us, leads to this estimate right here. So that's the intuition behind this argument. Uh, okay, um, so the next thing I want to do about uh, involving hyperbolic geometry is, so here's a definition. Uh, so we'll say that two, so now we're going to consider infinite geodex geodesics. So recall a geodes geodesic is a sequence, an infinite geodesic, I just mean a sequ an infinite sequence. Right? And we'll say that two, so here's the definition is that, uh, so again, gamma, gamma a uh, hyperbolic graph. Uh, so two, geodesics to infinite geodesics. So these are rays, if you like, uh, to infinite alpha and beta are equivalent if the limit as n and m tend to infinity of alpha m beta n, this Gromov product, O is equal to infinity. And this is where O is some fixed point in gamma, the origin, O for origin. Um, and it's pretty easy to see. So this is the Gromov product, which remember, so here's the picture here. So we have, you know, some point O and the idea is that we have some, uh, you know, alpha is some, some path. So alpha is going to be something like this. This is maybe alpha. Beta is going to be something like this. And what do we see here? We have some alpha n. 
I think this may be a different color. Uh, we have here, this is some point alpha n, and then we have some point over here, beta m. And now we draw the uh, comparison try. So we have this uh, triangle. So, and then we draw the comparison tripod. And the comparison tripod should look something, uh, you know, maybe, you know, maybe we took beta way, way far out here. Uh, so, beta n, alpha n, o. And remember, the Gromov product is this distance, so we want this to be very large. So this was the Gromov. Right, the length of this. Uh, so what is this saying? This is saying that um, the intuitive thing should be that they're kind of pointing in the same direction. So this should somehow say that alpha and beta are pointing in the, the same uh, direction. If you had some, you know, if you had some alpha that looked like this, and then you had some beta which looked like this, if they went in their own, and then you have O here, well, eventually what you're gonna have is that the tripod is gonna look something like this, and you're gonna get some bound on this length here. Eventually it has to split. Um, so if there's no bound on the length, then that tells us that they kind of have to point in the same direction. Right, so this this equivalence says that rays have to point uh, in the same direction. Uh, and now, uh, so I'm calling them equivalent, but it's not obvious at all, maybe from this definition, that this is an equivalence relation. So here's now a lemma. So I'll have to wait till Monday to prove it, but let me go ahead and state it. Uh, so there exists. Uh, C greater than zero, so only depending on delta, such that uh, if alpha and beta are equivalent, are infinite geodesics, And if we take m greater than the distance between alpha naught and beta naught, so then uh, there exists uh, n, which is not too far away from m, m minus n plus 3 equal to this distance. Distance alpha naught beta naught uh, such that the distance from alpha m to beta n is less than c. Uh, moreover, so therefore, rather I should say, therefore alpha. Um, uh, therefore, the soup over M of the distance between alpha M and beta M is fine. All right, so what does this say? This says that, uh, you know, if you, if alpha is equivalent to beta, then you go out, this picture that I've drawn here is, is you know, really ac accurate. If you, if you go out, so if you have this distance here, and as long as you go out that far, there's always some point on beta, which is not so far away from it, right? Um, you know, some bound C. So you always have this bound, you know, these are all points that are distance no more than C. Uh, why is this? Well, this is because conversely, if you have this bound, if you have that uh, the two rays have this bound that I've drawn here, then you can also see pretty easily that they will be equivalent. They'll satisfy this condition here. That's pretty obvious. We'll, we'll mention that next time.
So therefore, we have a new uh, characterization of equivalence, which is just given by this, right? So two infinite geodesics are equivalent if and only if the distance between uh, alpha m and alpha n is, is bounded by infinity. And the nice thing about this is because this obviously defines an equivalence relation by the triangle inequality. Uh, so that's why we'll prove this lemma. As a consequence of this lemma, we'll see that this defines an equivalence relation on these infinite geodesics. And then as just a preview for what we're going to do, so we'll prove this lemma next time, and then we're going to define the Gromov boundary of gamma is uh, this, which is the, the equivalent space of equivalence class, the space of equivalence classes. of infinite geodesics. So uh, yeah, so this this is how we're going to define the boundary as, as such equivalence classes. And we'll we'll prove next time we'll prove this lemma and then we'll prove that the, the boundary has a nice topological structure and we'll prove that in certain situations it's compact and, and gives us a nice thing. Uh, for instance, if, if you're a finally generated group. All right, any questions?